So, just a quick disclaimer to start. It says introduction, so if there are experienced procedural macro users in the room, just go sit in the back and sleep a little bit, take a power nap. Uh, I'll wake you up after the entire presentation. So, imagine you're writing an application that will monitor the guests at a conference. You probably want to organize each guest into a struct and gather all their data. A bit like this. Except what we can do slightly better. Uh, let's make one change. Yeah. We don't need any redundant information in there. So let's just get rid of that field. OK, so next, we want to add a couple of derives, because we will definitely want to clone and debug and do other stuff with that struct. And now, you've probably guessed from the last uh, derive, we're also going to be adding a SQL database for storing the guests. So let's start with a function that will list all the guests from our database. Cool. And now we've introduced a an asynchronous function. So we'll have to add asynchronicity to our Tokyo main and, uh, and add a Tokyo main. And with that, we've written a small but functional application. And all along the way, macros have been there to help us avoid a lot of boilerplate, avoid a lot of typing code, and also doing some pretty powerful stuff behind the scenes. And it's these macros, the procedural kind especially, that are the topic of today's talk. My name is uh, Sam van Overmeer. I'm a Belgian. I worked as a historian and archaeologist before turning to a career as an IT consultant with Branch, uh, where I mostly help write cloud applications uh, in languages like Java, JavaScript, uh, and a bit of Python. I'm a newcomer to Rust, having learned the language in 2022. And in 2023, in a moment of hubris, I decided I would write a book about macros, mostly because I like writing things, but also because, as was said in the introduction, I felt that this was an area where the Rust community could use some more learning resources. So this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour of Rust macros, how to read them, how to write them, what they do. And it's also going to involve a live demo, so we better get going. So macros are the main form of metaprogramming that's available in Rust. And with metaprogramming, for the purpose of this talk, I mean that I'm not writing code to write more code, uh, to execute commands, but I'm writing code that will generate additional code. Uh, this process is sometimes called expansion, so the macros are expanded, and this happens at compile time, which means that the generated code is added to your other code, and everything has to pass through the same compile time checks. Um, so generated code and normal code has to compile successfully. Now, why would you use macros? Well, avoiding boilerplates is one very important reason. Uh, declarative macros are very useful for this, as are derives. For example, the derive debug and clone. They're very easy to write and also to read, because they clear clearly show an intent to the reader of your code. They don't have to go through the entire implementation. They just know this particular struct or enum is debuggable. Another reason to turn to macros is that they can do things that normal Rust can, so functions, structs, enums, etc. And one example of this is variadic functions, where you functions should take a variable number of arguments. You can't do that with normal functions that are not supported. So in that case, you would have to turn to a macro. There are two types of macros in Rust, declarative and procedural. The declarative kind, we'll quickly go over that. It's declared with macro rules followed by the name. And then you have a couple of pattern matching rules that will tell your Rust code uh, what to do for each input. So if I have an empty input, generate this code. If I have this particular input, generate this bit of code. An example of this, quite well known, is VEC, where you create a new vector. Um, this is the declaration from the source. It says macro rules, the name of the macro vec. And it says in three rules what should happen when there's an empty input. It should ju just generate an empty vec. Or for the last rule, if you have multiple elements, that they should each be added into the vec that was created. So the main topic here, procedural macros. These are different in that they don't have this pattern matching language. Instead, they work with token streams, both as an input and as an output. These token streams, well, for the purpose of this talk, and also because I'm not an expert in parsing and lexing, etc., um, just consider them as a low-level representation of your code. And we manipulate these token streams using normal Rust code. 
meaning that we can do some very powerful things, anything we can do with Rust code with them. But it also means that there's a risk of additional complexity because we can do anything we want. Another reason they're a bit more complex when used is that they require a separate crate for usage. So you can't just add them to your application. You have to declare a separate macro crate and then start importing them in your application or library, etc. There are three types of uh, procedural macros. The first are derive, which you all know, the derive clone example that we saw earlier. Or in the case of the below signature, it would be derive hello. Uh, these can be used on structs, enums, and also on unions, um, and they only add derived code to an existing struct. They cannot modify existing code. Attribute macros are well named because they declare a new attribute that you can use in your code. In the below case, it's public. Uh, Tokyo main is also an example of an attribute macro. And these can be used on structs, enums, and unions, just like a derived macro, but also on functions in addition. And these will replace the input tokens that you give it which means you can modify existing code. This also means that uh, when you're annotating a struct with one of your new macros, and it's only uh, producing an empty output token stream, that your input will be deleted. So the struct will be gone from your code base. So be careful with that. There's also an additional token stream in there that can be used for attributes, analyzing those. Finally, function-like macros. They look like functions, yeah, and they, in usage there, are similar to um, declarative macros, so the name followed by an exclamation mark, private exclamation mark, for example, here. And these can be used almost anywhere in your Rust code base. And it will also replace the input tokens, just like attribute macros. This can be very useful when you're writing DSLs, so domain-specific languages, things that are not actually valid Rust. Because if the input was not uh, removed on compilation, then you would have that DSL remaining in your code base, and Rust would start uh, complaining that uh, you've got invalid stuff in there. This is an example from the book, uh, a Yuck macro, so infrastructure as code macro for working with the AWS Cloud, where we're just saying in a pretty readable way that we want to generate a bucket called unique name, yeah, very original, uh, and a Lambda called another name. The arrow in between signifies that we want to generate an object notification event that will be sent to the Lambda so we can analyze it. So that was both an example of a DSL from the book and also an example of the power of macros, what they can do behind the screens. You know, whether it's advisable to do something this powerful, uh, yeah, I'll leave that up to you. OK, so now we'll try a quick demo where we talk about SQS. SQS is the queuing service of AWS. And we'll write a derived macro to help us with that. Now, I have no idea if this is big enough. Uh, no. I was afraid of that. Like right yes. So, use a custom font. So I'm going to try to go for a Belgian compromise, which means that no one will be happy. Uh, is this big enough? Bigger? Okay. No, that's too big. <laughs> it's still remaining small. Come on, ship. Yeah, for the actual code here. Oh, it's not working. Uh, increase font size. Yeah. I guess that's the most important bit. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Okay, if there are no more complaints, I'll leave it at this. Um, so, what we've got here is a bit of setup. I'm, sending the, I'm setting the region of the AWS that I want to work with. And this is also using local stack, because I don't want to be dependent on my Wi-Fi connection. And thank God, because I don't have a Wi-Fi connection right now. Um, so local stack will mimic, mock uh, the services locally. It's running in a Docker container. Next, I have the structs that I want to send to SQS, to the queue. It contains a name and a country, plus some useful derives. In my Tokyo main, I'm just calling my basic example, which is first creating an SQS client. So that's from the AWS SDK. It's a client for talking with the queue. Then I'm sending a message, passing in the queue URL, and sending the message body as a string, changing the struct into a string. Then I'm sending, awaiting, and I'm retrieving the messages that I had. So again, sending in queue URL, getting the messages, and turning the bodies, which I expect to be my structs, into um, 
from string into my struct again, and then printing out the result. And now, if I do a cargo run, this works. I received the message uh, that I sent to the queue. So this is OK, but it's a lot of boilerplate. I, what I would prefer is just to have a message that I can send and receive without all the transformations and passing the queue URL, et cetera. And so instead, what I want to do is something like this. I've got a derived example. I'm again creating the client, but I'm passing it into an, a destruct that I'm generating. Note that we could have also added methods to the existing structs, um, but this allows me to demonstrate how you can generate no new names from existing ones. So the name of the new struct is based on yeah, hard-coded bits, as just client 4, followed by the name of the struct message, or it could have been other message, uh, whatever your name was. Then I'm passing in some required stuff, and I can just send the struct that I want, while also receiving it without any further hassle. Okay. So how would we start writing this? Well, for some additional setup here, I've got a reference to a local crate, your Rust derive macro. Because as I said, you can't just derive, uh, add the derive macro to your application. You need to put it in a separate crate. And this way, I can already start using that one. And in the library crate, I've, there are two interesting things. Namely, I've set the lib section to proc macro true meaning that Rust will only allow me to export macro functions from this particular crate, uh, nothing else. And I've also got two useful dependencies here. It's quote and sin. Quote is used for outputting your information as a token stream. It takes care of that for you. And sin is the other side of the coin. It parses the incoming token streams, so they are easier to work with. You don't necessarily need these dependencies, but they're very useful. And in practice, almost any macro that you find on the internet will use these um, two dependencies at the very least. OK, the lib itself is still empty, so let's start writing a function. I'll call it something, because the name doesn't really matter in this case. And I'll add a token stream input. And I also want a token stream output. Now, IntelliJ is already complaining here. Because, as I said, this is a proc macro crate. I can only export uh, macro functions. So I have to add the right annotation. In this case, it's proc macro derive, followed by the name that I want to have for this particular uh, derive macro. In this case, sender, you could have picked SQS sender, anything you want. Now we still have to return something. So we'll start very simple by just calling the quote macro from the dependency I mentioned earlier. And if you call that one without any arguments, it just returns an empty tone stream. The code is still complaining, though, because it's using proc macro 2. Quote is using that wrapper around the proc macro library um, because it has a couple of advantages, like it's easier to unit test. And Rust itself is actually expecting me to return a normal tone stream if, instead of this one from the wrapper, which we can just solve with into. And now, I can already add the derived macro here. As I said earlier, it's only adding code, not deleting anything. So this should work. Everything still compiles. Now, yeah, of course, we're not doing anything. So you might be wondering, yeah, is this, actu is this actually working? So we'll prove that by returning some hard-coded outputs. Uh, quotes helps you, the macro helps you with just writing normal Rust code that will then be turned into a token stream by quote for you. So if I just write struct something, that code will be added to my output, which I can prove by, for example, doing something stupid like adding struct something here. IntelliJ doesn't notice anything, but yeah. Now it's saying, OK, you have to struct something both in your application and it's already defined uh, through the macro. Uh, note that we're just pointing to the macro in general, to sender. If you want better error handling, you have to do a bit of more work. By, by default, it will always just point to where the derive is used. A better way of looking at what you're actually producing is to use Cargo Expand. As I said earlier, expansion is the adding of the generated code to your application. Um, and expand is a useful command for actually doing that. In this case, I'm going to output the content to a temporary file so we can just inspect it. 
Note that the original main, it's like 80 lines long, and this one is 320, so a lot of stuff is added by macros. Not only our own, because we've got the debug one here as well, and the Saturday is always very, very long. Oh, no, it's okay, actually. Uh, and if we look around, we can see that our struct is in here as well. Okay. So thanks to Cargo Expand, we know that the output that we're generating is actually in our application. Let's now try to finish a first naive version of our outputs by just hard coding everything that's in here. Um, that will, will limit the usability, but we'll do something about that later on. So what I need is this particular struct, which will take a client. This is the prefix of the library, the SDK, which I'm adding because I want to be very specific what I want to receive. Um, if there's another client in the code of the user, I d certainly don't want it clashing with my client here. So I want to be very specific. It's only an SQS client that you can receive. Now I want to implement the first function, which I'll just call new, just the name. And then we need arguments here. So same. And QURL, which is a string. So always check. Oh no, I don't want to do that. And that still works. Um, and now we, we can activate a little bit more of our code because this in IntelliJ doesn't notice, but this is fine. Um, so what we also want to do is add the other two functions. The first one was send, which takes a self and a message to send, and it re returns nothing. And for the implementation, I'm going to be making myself really easy. I'm going to cheat a bit by just adapting the existing code I got here. It looks nicer. Okay, so we've got a send client. Here I want to reference to the URL. I want to make sure that this matches. And I also want uh, receive methods, like self. And this one will return a vec of message. Again, we're just hard coding the type. We'll fix that in a moment. And now I can take this bit and rearrange it. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm, the formatting is fine. Here we take the Q URL. And now we just want to turn this right. And we don't need the typing here because we've got our outputs and we have to return something. Let's see what Rust has to say. Okay, still working. We can probably comment out the rest of this code. And so now we're already generating something that's useful within our particular application, right? It's uh, all the boilerplate has been moved to the macro, except it's extremely limited right now. For example, if I thought this was a very useful macro and I had another message here, and IntelliJ is not noticing anything, but now it's not complaining, obviously, that I've got a duplicate, uh, especially, yeah, this one here, I've got SQS client for message two times because I'm just hard coding the outputs. So that won't work, and that's not good because we want it to be reusable. And also, if I were to just change the name here, like, yeah, okay, doesn't matter. It's complaining that, yeah, you've got a message that you're producing in your generated code, and I have no idea which one you're referring to. So instead, we should also refer to the right type. So for that, we'll have to look into the inputs, and I'll start by just printing what's in here so you can see. So this happens at compile time, so I just have to do a cargo check. And what you can see in the display outputs, it's just showing that uh, the entire struct with all its fields has been passed into the macro. The second debug output shows a little bit more of the underlying details. This is, in fact, a token stream. It has a lot of identifiers, so yeah, often keywords or names or types in Rust, and also a lot of other information, like the fields again, country is one I see right now, and the punctuation, uh, a lot more detail than was in the display setting. It also has a span, 
which is a reference back to the original source code where this came from, which means you can use this for better error handling. If a user made a mistake, you can point him to a specific place in your code and say, look, this field is wrong for whatever reason. Now that we've seen what this looks like, we will use the sin library that I mentioned earlier to parse the input. Uh, parse macro input is one macro that will help you do this. You also have parse and parse2 if you just want to use a function. The as derive input is syntactic sugar for just adding the type explicitly, so you can pick whatever you want. You can also print this one. Which I should have, yeah, whatever. Uh, right. That doesn't work. And again, you see that we have a lot of useful information in here, more detailed than the display from before, because derive input is a specific sin struct that will help you analyze anything that a derive input can take, a derive can take as an input, hence the name. So if we go into the source code, we can see, okay, it's got the visibility, it's got an identifier, which is the name of the struct or enum, the generics, and data, which contains three things, either struct, enum, or union, because those are the three things that a derived macro can take as an input. And just as an example, when we go further down to the named fields, we've got more information about fields like the attributes, what, what is the visibility, again, what is the name, the ident, and the type. So with this derived input, we now have something useful that we can work with. And the first thing we want to do is change the types, I think, because that will be the easiest bit. So we've got a message type here, which is the same as the name of the struct. So we should just retrieve that one, doing with as the ident, because that was a name. And I'll call this original struct name. And now we have to pass this into the quote macro for which there's a, like a DSL, a miniature language available. You just use hashtags and then refer to a variable. So if I do a hashtag, IntelliJ notices that, okay, this is actually referring back to this variable. And the content, this will be replaced by the content of that variable. Uh, you also have more advanced annotation for you if you have multiple elements that you want to add, but we won't be using that one here. So I've also got it hard coded over here. And I think that's everything. Yeah, probably. And so now that's OK, but we still have the same name for the uh, struct that we're generating. So let's instead uh, generate a new identifier. And it should really be an identifier, because we're going to re be replacing this. And Rust expects an identifier at this particular position. If you're passing in a string, well, this wouldn't work either. So uh, you really need to generate that identifier. There are a couple of ways we can do this. Uh, you can have an ident new method, for example, this one. But there's a convenience method as well, format ident, which works similar to how a normal format works. You have a hard-coded bit, and then you can pass in other stuff, like the original struct name. So what I'm generating now is the new struct name, and the last thing will depend on the name of the actual struct. Now, you're already familiar with this. Using the hashtag, I can replace this little bit over here. And now everything is more generic than it was before, which I can also show you by, yeah. I'll add the other message again. And if I, and this works, because yeah, now another struct is generated with another name. Similarly, if I change the name of the message struct, it will also just work. Well, except I haven't tested it yet. Uh, that's replace this one with a derive example. And maybe empty the queue first. Just to make sure no, nothing is in there. Yeah. OK, uh, cargo run. And we've received the second message, uh, as you can see, because I changed the name, from our derive example uh, from the queue. Which you can also see in local stack, it's saying that I sent and received the message. OK. Back to the slides. So when should you write macros yourself, and which kind should you pick? Well, it always depends in programming, but m maybe the general advice would be to use them as little as possible. Yeah, it might be strange coming from a guy selling a book on macros, but uh, 
it's something that you don't want to use, start with because it will make your code more uh, complex both to read and to maintain. On the other hand, if you can't elegantly solve problems like a lot of boilerplate with normal Rust code, then maybe you could turn to a macro instead. And of course, stuff like DSLs is also something that you will only be able to do with macros. If you look back at the example we just saw with SQS helper, should we have turned to macros in this case? And the answer is probably not, because we could have used normal functions and generics. Um, if we had used a small extension where the SQS helper had a builder where you can pass in each individual field that is in the original struct, then we probably would have had to turn to macros because those are the only ones that can introspect the fields that are present and generate the right methods as output. The other advice would be to start simple. Declarative macros are probably the easiest to read and to write, unless you go way too complex. Um, next up, derived macros, because they only add code instead of uh, modifying existing ones, so more predictable. And also because a derived macro, as I mentioned briefly earlier, it will communicate uh, what it's doing more clearly in many cases. Like in the introductory example, we had the from row derived macro. And the first one time that I used that one, I immediately had the idea like, OK, this is going to take a row and turn it into my struct without ever looking at the actual definition of uh, the macro, which turned out to be correct. So in those cases, like clone, debug, from row, it's very obvious what is happening. Unfortunately, our SQS helper kind of fails at this uh, test as well. The sender part, maybe we could have changed it into SQS sender, but no one would have guessed that this is generating another struct. To, yeah, it would have been better in this case to just add the, uh, the, the new methods to the existing struct. That would have been a bit clearer. Finally, if you have to modify existing code, if you want to write DSL, you'll have to turn to attributes or function like macros because they're the only ones uh, doing that. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the conference, and if there are any questions.